So this final panel is a little different. It's organised around a paper that was published in Nature Climate Change that deals very much with the issues raised in the prior panel. And my job, such as I have one, is to moderate this, but it's very hard because I don't really know anything about this topic at all. So in the interest of framing this panel and trying to broaden it out a little bit, so um, a few years ago I wanted to learn about bond markets, and I didn't really know a lot beyond the textbooks. So I, I started hanging out with bond traders, which was interesting. And then I started going to their conferences. And then I figured out an even better gig, which is to get invited as a speaker at their conferences. And then you get to know lots of stuff. So now that I want to know lots of things about the environment, I decided to organize an environment conference. So this is purely selfish and educative in terms of my own education. So thank you for being here and doing this. It's great. Now, when I started today, I Mark said this. paid the bill. Just want to make this Yeah, I also clear. paid the Let's bill. So this is what I mean by organizing the conference, right? So, so there we go. Um, now, I started the, the day by saying this controversial claim, which was designed to infuriate economists, saying that the language of externalities is not enough. And it was great. Everyone immediately went, what did you just say? And of course, President Paxson came up and said, that's silly. And, and Armin, where is he? Armin said the same thing. Now, there was a reason for doing this. And it's not because I'm actually you know, an idiot. Uh, I may be, but that's not the reason. It's because I'm interested in language in politics and the way that we talk about things. And if you think about our discourse today, it's been very much a discourse, particularly in the first half, not to brag on the economists, but it's a technical language. Uh, it's a very precise, precise technical language that talks about Pigovian taxes and externalities, etc. And then in the second one, it's about data and evidence and so on and so forth. And, and you'd expect that. That's what we do. We're social scientists, right? We care about these things, and we should care about these things. But there's a bit of a problem, because the other side doesn't care about this at all. Right, so we talk about the price of carbon and so on and so forth, right? And, and they don't give a damn about the price of carbon, theoretically or otherwise. And then there's a problem of translation, right? What do you care about? So much of politics is about affect rather than facts. How does it make you feel? And, you know, we're not very good as a species at dealing with large, slow-moving sort of convexities that just seem to get more and more terrifying over time. So, you know, we're kind of built into not dealing with this sort of stuff. And we try and, as we always do as social scientists, take the veil away. Let's talk about the facts. Let's think, find things as they, as they really are. But if we look at the adverts we were shown, it's a very old game to uh, just ignore the facts completely and to concentrate on affect. I mean, the fuels of tomorrow are here today. What does that even mean? Have you got a time machine? I mean, it's just bullshit. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> So what, what, are you, and then the thing, what, what, I'm in favor of growth. Are you not in favor of growth? Oh, I don't know, can I not be in favor of growth? Right? So, you know, one of the things I do when I'm not hanging around here is I'm a big football fan, by which I mean soccer, right? That thing you're doing this weekend, I have no idea what that's about, right? But I hang out with soccer fans, and I, I try and explain to them these things. And I find when I use my social science language, it, I might as well just literally be banging my head off a brick wall. But when I use a politics of affect, when I talk about how these things make you feel, they understand it, and they're deeply concerned and deeply worried, but don't have a language to articulate it. So there's a disconnect between our descriptions and our ambitions, and what is there in terms of building a movement which really could make a difference. A couple of examples just to, to, to frame this out and then I'll, I'll be quiet. So when I was doing my work on bond markets, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm married to a German and I, and I speak German, albeit badly, and um, the German word for, um, for uh, debt is schuld, which is the same word for guilt. <laughs> That'll tell you all you need to know about why they think Greeks and money are a bad idea. <laughs> it's written into the language. Uh, the Italians, the Italian word for, for belief is credo, as any Catholic will tell you from the Declaration of Faith, which goes to full faith and credit, right? So the way that we talk about things, how, they make, how those affectual dynamics are incredibly important, and no more so than, in, I think, honestly, in the 2016 election. Because in the 2016 election, we had a presidential candidate whose campaign was all about facts. You want policies? I've got a list of policies. I've got a policy for everything. I've got the RCT that scores how effective the policy is. You can look it up on my website. The other one had a big red hat and a slogan. The big red hat and the slogan wins every time. So this session that we have is called Pushing Against Climate Denial and Defending Science. Two, two things I'm completely committed to. But my question is how best to do this? Because if we rely on simply more facts, more clarity, more unearthing the truth, 
it presumes that the information deficit model is the way to go. And if we push more information into the system, it will make a difference. I think it does. I don't want to discount that. I think it's important. But we only ever really get these changes when people care. When you get to that moment where civil rights become something that someone who's not directly affected by that type of discrimination in power can be affected by. And that's where we need to get to. So my challenge for this last panel is not just to talk inside that box, but to talk about what we need to do to take it to the next step. So who's first? Uh, we're going to start with a summary of this uh, paper which appeared in Nature Climate Change just like weeks ago, right? Like, yeah, a week or two. Eight, a week like ago. That. It's yeah. called Evidence-Based Strategies to Combat Science Misinformation. Justin Farrell, Catherine McConnell, and Robert Brule, and they're all here, and they're going to yeah. come up. And then we're also going to have Kurt Davies from the Climate Information Center and Rhode Island Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. And I'll be very brief. Um, so Katie was a co-author and also Bob. Um, and yeah, it just came out. I think some of you may have read it. It was sent around, but I wanted to just briefly summarize the four main uh, sections of this paper. And within the academic world, as we we just were talking about, there's been a growing body of research on um, climate contrarianism, the counter movement, denial, um, whatever you want to call it, and it's spread across multiple fields, but mostly in sociology. Um, and I, I felt like last year that we were last year we were in D.C. for some meetings and. Um, some of us were talking, and we we sensed the need for um, a synthesis of work that's been done, but not just a dry review of the academic literature, but actually a synthesis that moves us towards some something, um, towards strategies for starting to combat these sorts of things. And this we thought might be helpful for um, those in politics, those running organizations, just kind of whoever. So it's a very bird's eye view. Um, uh, article and very practically oriented in, a, in, in an applied way. Um, but off the top, I do want to say much of this work uh, is indebted to people like Kurt Davies and organizations like his. Um, and a lot of us are just building off the work that they've been doing um, for almost decades, really. And um, so I wanted to say thank you, Kurt, for the work that you've done for the organization and for um, allowing us and giving us um, really sort of a, a platform, but also having given us data nowadays with, with digitizing data and all of that. So I wanted to make sure to, to mention that. Um, so based on, on the, based on the best social science research, we group our, our, our findings or our, our re this research in this area into four different um, sections. And, and the first is, I have them listed here, and then I left room for another if I'm um, just to kind of um, stimulate conversation here as well. So the first we identify, uh, there's, there's been a growing body of research on public inoculation. Um, so um, there's some folks, in, I think in mostly in psychology, who are, who are drawing on medical principles about uh, preventing infection through vac the use of vaccines. Um, so they're, they're testing these ideas of attitudinal inoculation essentially giving the public information that um, exposes them to these arguments that, and these lies that they're going to hear before they hear them in hopes that they'll recognize them and, and refute them. Um, and that includes telling them the sources of that information. Um, and so that's one line of work that's very early on, but it's growing and it's promising. Um, and, and they're starting to do experiments um, in that arena. Um, I will say within this section also we, we cover um, Challenges to the, the, what one person mentioned earlier is the information deficit model. It's commonly referred to as that in terms of slamming people on the head with more and more information, as you're saying, um, and hoping that they're going to change their mind. Um, I'm originally from Wyoming, and my father worked for Union Pacific for 40-some years, and a lot of what they do is transport coal. I'm never going to change my dad's mind about coal or even about climate change, right? And, um, and so I don't even really try. I'm not going to show him graphs of, um, that we saw earlier or climate science, really. Um, and so I think that we need to keep in mind that a lot of um, this, a lot of people's views of climate is culturally um, due to cultural context, due to experiences and things like that, not due to information, right? Due to stories, to narratives, those sorts of things. Um, so we review some of that work. Um, second would be legal strategies. Um, so lawsuits that tar target um, bad, act, bad faith actors um, what, and their liability, what they knew. Um, I won't go into all of that. It's pretty self-explanatory. But we also highlight that 
research can help when scientists come under attack, as some climate scientists have. Um, we've received plenty of hate mail over the years, um, nothing like some people have, um, but research can help and defend those, those folks as well. Um, third is uh, the political mechanisms. Um, and so we identify um, uh, re social science research and that's helping with you know, public vigilance to better understand how and when the political process is being manipulated in these ways. Um, we have one example in the paper that I found to be really interesting. Um, back in 2018, um, the Intergy, Intergy Corporation, which is an energy company down um, in Louisiana, um, they acknowledged, uh, according to their own internal vest investigation actually, that they paid 50 actors um, to appear to New Orleans City Council uh, hearing on a controversial new power plant. Um, so they gave them uh, bright orange t-shirts printed with clean energy, clean energy, good jobs, reliable power. Um, and these, these were performers and they were hired um, to create the mirage of public support um, for their bid to, uh, to build this plant. Um, the actors, they were posed as obviously grassroots activists, um, but they signed a non-disclosure agreement. Um, they were given a financial bonus if they delivered a pre-written speech um, up on, on, sta on stage, but at the uh, podium. And they were, they were instructed to applaud every time um, someone at the meeting disparaged uh, renewable energy. So those are the sorts of things that are happening. Um, and we identify some of that um, research on those sorts of things. Um, and then second within this political mechanisms are, are you know, d divestment and some institutions engaging in that or considering that. Um, we find that as a, a strategy, obviously. And then third, um, targeting strategic st geographic areas who are going to be um, hit the hardest by, in the near term by climate change. Um, and for example, Florida, Alaska, obviously Rhode Island. Um, and so focusing efforts in particular areas um, we think might be a useful strategy based on research. Um, and then lastly, the financial transparency piece, which might be the m most difficult. And the pie in the sky is obviously there are better transparency laws. Um, so at least for researchers, we can track and understand the, these institutional networks and these actors and uh, bring that to light. And, and, um, and so that's kind of, again, a pie in the sky thing, but who knows. And, um, so I think I'll just leave it here. I also, again, put uh, a fifth category as other. Maybe we, we can't add it to the paper, but um, maybe we can talk about it. Thanks, Justin. Mark, you're uh, moderating. From the wrong side of the room. Here. So you got a microphone there. Well, I want to make sure we get Kurt Davies right away into this discussion. I'm sure he has reflections on each of these points. How about right. that, Mark? Um, okay. And then we'll pass we it up, the and then we're going to get rid of the slides. Yeah. yeah. Blinded by the slides. So, so you go ahead, and I'll work um, on this. Well, first of all, on that just that last notion about the uh, the actors being hired, the same company that was hired by Entergy, uh, Hawthorne, a PR company, um, was hired in the in the Waxman Markey uh, 2009 fight hired a subcontractor who wrote fake letters to congressmen from the NAACP, as if from the NAACP, on faked letterhead opposing the climate bill. And they were caught. And uh, now Senator Markey rung them up in a hearing and showed that this, you know, this conspiracy to fake support from the left or, or opposition from the left. So there's some dirty plays that go down in but this that stuff. But didn't, that didn't come out until after the bill was already Correct. Or something. Yeah. Yep. So that's just the it, it worked. It didn't. It no, worked. it didn't work. I mean, per Periola was one of the you know okay. uh, one of the targets, and he voted with the bill. But it, it mm -hmm. was intentional. We don't know if it worked. Actually, there's a okay. null set there. I, I don't know. Um, so where to start? I think. So my work. Uh, I started on climate 21 years ago, um, and then went to Greenpeace for 13 years, where I was research director. Uh, there, I, the my thing I'm most proud of was a project called Exxon Secrets which is 15 years old this year. And it's sort of a, a proto mapping program with a database of individuals and organizations that is um, dwarfed by modern technology, but it's a flash dr driven, you know, yeah, you're, I'm glad the academics are nodding as if it's valid, <laughs> but you know. <laughs> I inspired my work with those two articles. That's Ex excellent. So that's all I, I'm, I'm that's, I, I, I can go home. I, I've done my job. It's in Yale now. 
Um, so and I uh, so that project, what we what we were intending to do was actually teach journalists that they were being duped by these professional hired guns of the fossil fuel industry that um, started in the in the late 90s. That spike in your work is really remarkable. That starting in 1997 through the early 2000s, for many people the the climate denial story is all about the Global Climate Coalition in the 90s. The funding from Exxon actually increases after the year 2000, and they're targeting Senator McCain in the beginning, heavily targeting the, the McCain-Lieberman bills. Um, the funding to Competitive Enterprise Institute peaks in 2004, and then we outed it, and they were shamed into stopping funding CEI. They gave them $2 million from 97 through 2005, I believe, they ended it. And Cooler Heads Coalition, Myra Ebel, who's mentioned in this book, um, I mean, in this paper, ran something called the Cooler Heads Coalition, which we now know, we've just discovered in the last couple years, a new grant from Exxon in 1997, Exxon Foundation, to the, to the Competitive Enterprise Institute that's called climate change in the Exxon <laughs> Foundation report. And it was $90,000, we think, started the Cooler Heads Coalition. The Cooler Heads Coalition runs symposia on Capitol Hill whenever they can and puts out newsletters echoing the whole denial machine's um, uh, message. So they've been inoculating, you know, uh, proto-President uh, Trump for 20-plus years. I mean, the, there's a great article in the Washington Post by Bob O'Hara sort of tracing the Cooler Heads Coalition, 1997, to the Rose Garden killing of the Paris uh, Agreement and Myron Ebel all along the way. And you know, this is a guy who ran the transition team at the EPA by, uh, you know, only a stroke of luck called Donald Trump did he ever get that opportunity. Otherwise, he's, he's sort of, you know, uh, marginalized, um, at least we hope, but heavily funded by, you know, money that we don't even know anymore. After Exxon drops them, uh, we know there was some individual rich people funding Competitive Enterprise Institute, but they didn't go broke. They're still getting paid, um, you know, a lot of money to do this work. So that's one one uh, thought I had based on, on this paper was we have uh, the, the question I thought was the most interesting in the, in the beginning of it is how over the course of the 90s and the 2000s did half the American public and a large majority of Republicans become deniers? And I think it was systematic. I think that we can show, you know, your work shows that it is, um, it, it was a systematic and expensive, but relative to their profits, not very expensive program of inoculation. They put these words out through other voice boxes like Rush Limbaugh and other senators like Senator Inhofe, your colleague, um, to, to make, this, make this a reality, an alternative reality. And, um, and our side thinks that the facts are going to win. We are, you know, we think that we can have a logical, moral, ethical world where that, that all, you know, these things will happen. If that were true, we would listen to people like the economists have presented today. We would put a price on carbon. We would have gotten this done. But I want to read one thing that sort of I think is a, a bipartisan motivator. Um, nobody likes to be lied to. Doesn't matter if you're, you know, right, left, or center. No one likes to be lied to. And we've discovered, we put out a year ago, um, I think in March, a bunch of documents from Shell Oil Company uh, going back to the 80s. And in one of them, it turns out that Shell, uh, while not informing its shareholders at all, ran an internal study of the greenhouse effect starting in 1981 and concluding in 85. And we don't have any evidence except for a 1988 memo about that study in which they talk about how, um, quote, with the very long time scales involved, it would be tempting for society to wait until, you know, we feel climate change to do anything. But the potential implications for the world are so large that policy options need to be considered much earlier. Sort of espousing a precautionary principle in a way, and that uncertainty should not block us from acting. They go on to say, by the time the global warming becomes detectable, it could be too late to take effective countermeasures to reduce its effects or even to stabilize the situation. So this is 19, 
88. There is not even a shard of possibility of regulation yet. Uh, or maybe there is, Hansen. But they, they did this study in 81. So Reagan's in office. There's no regulation. There's deregulation. There's not even a, a hope or a, a thought. We're focused on the ozone layer. We're not doing anything about climate. And in this, in this paper, internally, they know regulations are coming. We have another, you know, from Exxon, we have similar information now. And when I say that to people in a dog park in my neighborhood, did you know Exxon had a whole team working on climate in 1981? Um, you know, the other amazing piece of evidence is this Natuna gas field in Indonesia. So Exxon discovers this enormous uh, bunch of gas off of Borneo in the ocean there. But they discover it's 70 percent carbon dioxide it with, in, in with the methane, in with the natural gas. So they figure um, we have to do, deal with this carbon dioxide because we can't sell it. So we can either dump it in the ocean. Oh, that would acidify the entire sea. Uh, we can vent it. And we, we just got a hold of a document. This was in the Inside Climate News reporting, the Exxon New uh, series, required reading. Everybody uh, came out in the fall of 2015. But we got a new document where one of their PR people within Exxon is saying, uh, yeah, I went to the meeting, and it turns out we would be the largest source of CO2 emissions on Earth, 1984. You don't, talk, you don't use the word emissions unless you're talking about pollution. Another Exxon document, Brian Flannery, their scientist, calls it the largest single point source of carbon dioxide. That's only a term of art in pollution. So this is, again, well before any regulatory regime is even on the horizon. Exxon knows that it's probably a bad idea to be the largest single point source of CO2. And this, again, would be just venting natural CO2 that's trapped in with this, this natural gas. They abandon the project because of this, because they can't deal with the CO2. I think it's the most stark example of uh, you know, pre-regulatory awareness of the liability. Then they go on to fund Competitive Enterprise Institute and lie to all of us uh, with, through surrogates about um, the urgency and, the, and the, uh, the matters that we need to deal with. So th this is just some of what I obsess about is getting these documents out. We have a, a site called climatefiles.com that we've built in the last couple of years. We have now over 250 documents totaling 3,500 pages plus of the, we call it the, the files that are hard to find um, anywhere else. So we've just assembled the best documents showing this legacy in one place. They're all on document cloud. They're searchable, downloadable, they're annotated, and then we write about them. Lawyers are using them. Um, it's working. And if you have any documents or you know anybody any oil industry retirees that we could meet who might have documents in their basement, um, call me. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, we, we know this is being used on the Hill and by journalists and by, um, by lawyers. So that's a, a long-winded opening salvo on this important subject. What's the website again? Climatefiles.com. I have to tell a story. Uh, before I taught at Brown, I taught at William & Mary for 10 years, and I would load up 12 undergraduates in a 12-passenger van and drive them up there to D.C. And there I, ha I would set up a, an afternoon of, of sessions, usually with a government person, an industry person, and an environmental person, and let them go at it. Well, the one that I had Kurt Davies in about 15 years ago, it must have been, um, I also had Myron E. Bell, who was the person he was just describing, who uh, was at, is at the Competitive Enterprise Institute was uh, Donald Trump's transition team person for the EPA. And Kurt Davies pulls out a copy of one of these leaked memos. And this one was for the global, what's the, it called? The 98 memo? Global, yeah, change. Global co Climate Change global Communications climate, Plan, yeah. Global Climate Change Communications Plan from the, this, co this ad hoc coalition called the Global Climate Coalition, an industry group largely funded by Western coal companies, et cetera, right? API yeah. and, and yeah. Yeah. API, yeah. American yeah. Petroleum Institute. And he said to Myron E. Bell, you, you were one of the drafters of this. You're, and in this plan, it says that one of the goals is to create doubt in the public about the reality of climate change and yeah. to stop action. And to make Explicitly. It to, yeah. to make it normal for them to, for the, to say that there's not certainty about this problem. 
And it actually says that he's being paid, he will be paid to talk to college students and to turn their opinions about climate change and create doubt in them. And Myron e. Bell just did not deny a single word of it and just sort of let it pass by and then went on to his next talking point. And the students' jaws were on the floor. <laughs> They're like, wow, this guy is not denying that he's been paid to lie to us about the biggest problem the planet faces. Uh, it's, it was a stunning moment, and I think it really uh, showed to me. I wish it was me. on tape. I, I wish I, I had it on tape. It's, in, it's on tape in my <laughs> mind. So anyway, I think it's one of the key moments. So they, I, I hope, were inoculated. But I think we should talk about these different strategies. It would be great to hear from the senator about these strategies, unless, Mark, you have another idea on how we're going. OK, we want to make sure that our authors of the paper can speak up. I was hoping you guys have the way. Other than carbon emissions, the dominant byproduct of the fossil fuel industry is lying. <laughs> they do it very effectively. They've done it for a very, very long time. And for that reason, many of the corporate institutional safeguards that prevent corporations from lying have been eroded or bypassed. So there are very few stops on their lying. But one thing that they do very sincerely and that we should take a lesson from is that they hide. That tells you a lot. They know they need to hide. So transparency is their chosen countermeasure for us. They don't hide for the fun of it. It's very expensive and complicated. You've got to set up all these groups. You've got to be able to move your message through dozens of them so that nobody gets wise to who you're hiding behind. There's a very considerable operation to this. But they tell you a lot when the most sincere thing that they do is to hide. So that's a pretty strong signal to us. So what should we do specifically about that? One thing is that the academic work that you all do is incredibly valuable, but there is a chasm between academia land and public land. And much of that never gets across the chasm. It's the valley of death. It's the valley of death. <laughs> Thank you. It is. So We don't know how to cross you, it. Well, Nobody's ever been across it <laughs> and come back alive. I mean, inside Climate News and others, yep. uh, your group, Kurt, do a good job of trying to intermediate and get some of that information across. But everybody who works in this space needs to have an asterisk next to all of their projects that thinks, OK, how do I get this out of academia land and into the rest of land? Bob Brule is working on trying to take a full volume of a journal that I had never heard of. I've never heard of it. I think it's called the Journal of Memory and Cognition on the way in which fossil fuel interests manipulate speech and communication in order to communicate their message. It's about eight or nine different articles. It is impenetrable to the ordinary mortal. But it has very powerful messages in it that can be backstopped into quotes in these peer-reviewed articles. But somebody has to go through the effort of doing that. I did it for a climate speech. I can't do that very often. I am exhausted after doing that one. <laughs> so how do you translate? academia land work into the public domain. Very important for you guys to figure out and to make it a focus. Second, we've got to out the intermediaries, the surrogates. They get away with murder by pretending that Heartland Institute has something to do with the Heartland, or that the Competitive Enterprise Institute has something to do with competitive enterprise. These are front groups. These are shams. They were set up to do this, or in some cases, inherited from the tobacco industry to move forward and do this. And with a little bit of effort, we can out the intermediaries and the surrogates. Quick story. 17 of us went to the floor of the Senate to make fun of what we called the web of denial, all these phony baloney groups. And we spread them out amongst 17 senators and took them on in, in different ways over two days. It was a pretty concerted blast. Not only are they signaling you when they hide, their response was a very strong signal, too. They went bats. <laughs> they went bats logically. 
our number one argument was that they are not independent groups. They are a consolidated, coordinated entity with just tentacles. So how did they dispute that? By sending us a single letter with each of their letterheads on the single letter. <laughs> Clearly, they had they lost their logical the minds <laughs> in their upset to send a letter like that. And then, if I recall correctly, one entire paragraph was shame, comma, shame, comma, shame, exclamation mark, and lots of talk about tyranny. So they clearly had lost their emotional grip as well. So this is a really good sign that when you go after them, it hurts. So we need to go after them. The biggest thread connecting all this is the dark money. That's how ExxonMobil, by running money through donors' trust, can pretend that it doesn't fund Competitive Enterprise Institute or whomever. So we've got to undo those dark money channels. Here is the good news. Dark money enjoys no legal privilege. It's not an attorney client. It's not a spousal communication. It's just not by law disclosed. But that doesn't mean that it's not amenable to, for instance, a house subpoena or a subpoena in litigation. So there are ways that we can start, now that we control the House, digging into whose funding is where. We've got to be smart about how we do it, and they're going to fight back like panthers. I mean, this is like a deep sea diver with his hose to the surface. You start messing with that hose, that deep sea diver is going to go berserk. It is their full source of livelihood and support. So we've got to be prepared for that. We've got to be smart about it, but oh my, what an opening exposing some of these selective dark money channels is going to be through subpoena. Discovery is going to be the same way. That's a separate thing. You've got to be a litigant to get there, but that's what broke the back of the tobacco industry. It'll be the same for them. And I'll close by saying, in all of these things, it's fun to be <laughs> on offense. It is fun to be on offense. And it's telling a detective story that people will be interested in. So. We've got a really big opportunity in front of us now that we've got the opportunity to dig out some of this. We do have to organize to make it happen. We do have to be persistent. It can't be each scientist for themselves trying to figure out how to counterattack the science denial apparatus or how to get their incomprehensible piece in the Journal of Semiotics and nobody ever read it into the public domain. But with a little bit of structure and a little bit of persistence, we can do this. We can win, and we can have such a great time doing it. Yeah, I mean, I, what do you say after that? I mean, it's going to be. Where shall we go? Yeah, yeah. You can tell what gets. I like my job. Gets gets um, gets them up in the morning. Um, so I had a few yeah, things, I, and I hate to do it. Yeah, well, you're the you're the moderator. There's your microphone right there behind it. Get your microphone. <laughs> So as a question, you were a prosecutor, correct? I did. Exactly. I did. Now, I'm thinking about the conversation this morning about basically you're not really telling the truth to shareholders, you're burying risk, all the rest of it. And dark money through these channels. I'm reminded of the career of the wonderful mayor of Providence, Buddy Chianci, in the sense that Buddy finally went to jail without actually having a charge of against him proven. He was rolled up in a RICO. And I'm beginning to think that this smells awfully like RICO territory, or am I wildly off base here? Is there any way that those statutes could be brought to bear? Not only, not only are they potentially relevant, but it was precisely the RICO statute, and specifically what does it stand for and what is it racketeering mean? influenced and corrupt organizations. And it's Sounds kind of relevant. <laughs> and within the RICO statute, there is a civil RICO count or authority that allows the Department of Justice to bring a civil lawsuit, not a criminal prosecution, to get an order requiring the racketeering entity to cease its fraudulent activity and to make appropriate amends. <clears throat> Under President Clinton and then President Bush, 
the United States Department of Justice brought exactly that civil RICO case against the tobacco industry mm -hmm. for its persistent fraud using the exact same apparatus that the fossil fuel industry then went and borrowed and morphed up. And they won. They won a trial. They won on appeal. The Supreme <laughs> Court wouldn't take it up. It is good law. And the complaint is a Anybody who cares about climate can read that complaint, and all you have to do is switch health care for climate and tobacco for fossil fuel, and it's kind of right there in front of you. It's distressing to me that under President Obama, nobody would even take a look at that. It was given a decent burial deep within the FBI someplace with no prosecutor or lawyer evidently looking at it. Um, but it merits, I think, a look, because the government did that case and won that case. And once you're in, guess what? You get discovery. And now you're into their files. And I think these companies know how bad their files are for them. I think they'll fold like a cheap suitcase once you're into their files. Which companies is that you were talking about? Those are the oil companies or those are the Fossil supporting? The, the tobacco the companies were the ones yeah. that did this. You'd have to be careful about picking your defendants in this, but presumably some of the big oil companies would be liable. What would be interesting would be to go into some of the support entities, particularly the public relations entities, because law firms are tough to wrestle with because everything is like privileged and hard to get out of them. But there is no privilege for what you tell your PR hack. And if they've got files or if they have, you know, can be shown to have deliberately destroyed files as part of it. That's another really terrific window into this game. Mm -hmm. So I, I just before we open it up, well, no, here we have one of the authors of the paper. So pass the mic back there. Yeah. Here, Bob. I'm curious to hear from Senator Whitehouse and Kurt's perspective what your sense of the, like, what we would call the literature gaps are. So we have our sense of, from reading these journals, where we think the holes are in the work that we want to do. But I'm curious from folks who are working more out in the rest of the world, what work would be helpful for us to start doing more actively? Valley Is that for of both death. of them or just for the senator? Valley of death, first and foremost. It doesn't work if it gets buried in academic journals and never makes the transit Assuming into popular knowledge. Assuming we can get over the valley. Value. What should we be doing? Um, I think that um, the role of some of these other companies that do support work for the denial thing but aren't the fossil fuel industries themselves, like Star, PR firms and, yeah. Legal I think firms. The, uh, yeah. Legal, again, gets complicated. <laughs> PR firms and advertising firms and things like that are, are, I think, very helpful. Yeah, lobbying, lobbying firms, although now you're getting... Not the, not the Near to lawyering, you, but it's, um, and then I uh, think that um, it would be great to have more work on the discrepancy between corporate America's, the good guys, not the fossil fuel scoundrels, their uh, public description of their care about climate change and so forth versus their lobbying and electioneering presence. And what you'll find is that, because um, we've done the work ourselves, Coke and Pepsi are probably two of the better companies in terms of being forward on climate stuff, doing good sustainability stuff in-house, worrying about their supply chains and all of that. They're good citizens. They don't raise this issue in Congress. They run a trade association called the American Beverage Association that doesn't lift a finger on doing anything about climate change. And they run money through the American Beverage Association to the US Chamber of Commerce, which is probably our most powerful and inveterate adversary on getting anything done on climate. So it's a specific example of how these two companies, which are good on climate, in Congress are the opposite. <coughs> They actually have a huge discrepancy between their stated principles and their lobbying and electioneering practices. That's not a good place for companies to be, public-facing companies, and it's not a good place morally for people to be. So spotlighting that, I think, would be very helpful. And then to the extent you can dig into why the National Association of Manufacturers is a climate-denying group, 
when there's a lot of manufacturing in green and renewable energy. I think those things that you put the solar panels on have to be manufactured, and the things that the wind vanes are attached to and all the wiring, that all has to be manufactured. So what's going on there? And to the extent that people can investigate some of that, that would be interesting to poke and probe at. Because the good guys have a lot of uh, crimes of omission. Kirk, did you want to reflect on that one? Um, I, I wonder if the, the language software, the machine learning and scanning magic that you guys are doing could be put to uh, look at, well, anecdotally, I know from someone who probably, had, you know, couldn't provide evidence but knew that most, if not all, of the op-eds opposing climate action in the 90s were ghostwritten and were placed. I mean, that's not uncommon. I mean, op-eds are ghostwritten all the time, right, left, and center. But if there was a way to trace specific language and phrases and, and you know, with plagiarism software, or with something that would show a lineage of the output in a way that we could, we could go back to the, you know, figure out the origin points of certain, um, you know, uh, word choices or, or certain things that would, because it was, it was um, very artfully done. You know, they would put out surrogates from different, different voices, um, including probably even senators. You know, the, the, these op-eds pop up even today, like opposing carbon tax out of the blue. And, and you don't, th I don't think the senator wrote it, you know, whoever comes out with it. So you, you um, not accusing a senator of plagiarism or, I mean, of uh, ghosts, or, being ghostwritten, but you know, if there's if we have an interest in getting something out, and you think it'd be great if I got you know so and so to, to say this, and somebody wrote it, I don't know if that is close to what you guys could do, but I just, could actually Justin's target actually you just some one wee bit uh, closer onto something. I asked Attorney General Lynch about civil RICO in the Judiciary Committee in a hearing. There was I do my office collects my clips, so I know what's said about me out in the yeah. press world. So nobody covered that. There was zero press attention to that whatsoever. But after about four days, my clip started to light up with op-eds about what a wretched person I was to ask such a wretched question right. and how exactly it was it. trying to criminalize free speech and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And over the next couple of weeks, there were 50 of those. And I was a little bit annoyed, so then I wrote an op-ed piece in the Washington Post saying we really, we really ought to look at civil RICO and the racketeering statute and whether the tobacco case is a model for a case in the fossil fuel space. Again, you know, they get this stuff all the time. There was no secondary coverage. It went up on the paper, it went down, and for days there was no press reaction. And then poof, what do you know? On came the op-eds. Again, 50. <laughs> and I think I read it over every single one of them. And if you do, it, it does not take artificial intelligence. No. Even my, <laughs> even my simple mortal intelligence Seemingly could tell yeah. that there was a master script that they were working right. off of. But the Tem more you can a template, but the more you can follow that up and prove that, the better. Ju yeah. Justin has Which some research he can tell us about on this. And by the way, thank you for this article. I got it. I read it. I highlighted it. I sent it out to my staff. I loved it. You guys are terrific. Good. Um, yeah, actually, is this on? Um, in, a, in another article in Nature Climate Change, I used semantic similarity analysis, which is essentially plagiarism detection. And you can get a, actually a score between two documents right. for how similar they are. I was looking at um, how denial texts rec were showing up in like the Wall Street Journal. Um, so I collected all Wall Street Journal uh, articles that mentioned climate change or global warming. You went out. You lost your mic. Coming. There it goes. Yeah, now it's back on. Back on. Was it coming from no. denial organizations and what they were writing? And so it's really interesting. You can quantify exactly how close two documents are, and you can even look at use of, of specific sentences or phrases, and you can get some granularity. And what did you there. find, Justin? Um, well, I didn't look at between denial, like folks. So was the same person writing the same document? I just looked in the Wall Street Journal, and yeah. and over time, a lot of um, the words and phrases and the documents became more similar. Um, so it was this sort of uniform uh, movement, I guess. Um, yeah. Uh, another anecdote on this, or another time when I wish I knew how to do this, was uh, we were campaigning when I was at Greenpeace. 
we were campaigning in Florida during the Jeb Reno, Jeb Bush, Janet Reno um, race. And we ran a campaign called What's Up Sunshine State because there's no solar, pro-solar policy down there. We we're just doing basically, you know, running around, giving them grief like Sunrise is doing now, but amateur hour compared to what they're doing now. But we did get them both to respond, and we got Jeb to start talking about solar power and um, got a meeting even. And suddenly, you know, we got a couple positive articles in the Miami Herald. And we threw a party, you know, we thought we had won. And literally, a couple days later, this Texas-based, Exxon-funded, I learned later, organization writes a letter to the editor attacking solar as useless technology, not ready for prime time, will never do anything, you know. What do you do at night? Yeah, just go away, right? It literally, I'm like, why is someone from Texas reading the Miami Herald, first of all? <laughs> or who gave him the marching orders to write that LT letter to the editor? Um, and how many of those, how many other of those would you find if you found pro-renewable articles in a paper and then found this backlash that was someone's job, right? That was someone's stated job. And in this case, it was get 50 letters out. Yep. And they're like, yeah, check, and they're going to report check. that to the uh, yep. trade organization. So I want to just raise a couple of points on this article. Um, and I don't want it to be, I mean, you, you really sort of, got us fired up, uh, so I hate to be a little bit of a wet blanket here, but oh, I feel like I'm happy. <laughs> and then maybe, you know, like I, I, I'm from a big family, so i got to somehow bring these economists back into the discussion. Um, so um, I'm worried about the public inoculation because uh, that is there is going to be pushback uh, for every action, there's this equal or opposite and maybe much stronger reaction. So there's, I think if you're inoculating, there's, there's already been inoculation on the other side, it's going to be a back and forth battle, I think, so many times. The surveys, for example, there's a recent survey that we talked about recently showing that when people hear that they've been lied to about climate change, then their belief in the reality of the problem goes up by 9%, you know, like, that is, not individuals, but the population goes from like 61 to 70 percent, right? Or that believe that climate change is real and human caused and all that. Across stuff. all parties. Across all parties. So it's very substantial effect of being told you've been lied to on climate change, and it was systematic. But what I'm concerned about is that that was a survey that doesn't account for the pushback that's about to come as soon as these companies then you know, launch yet another more, yet more sophisticated campaign of public, you know, public opinion shifting. So they will, they will actively go after the people who told you you were lied about, lied to. They will say that they're liars, you know, I'm not a liar, they're liars, or something like that. Um, you know, in some ways that's kind of the Trump specialty is calling somebody a liar um, when they're telling, calling you a liar. Um, so anyway, I'm a little bit worried about that. I'd love to be told why I'm wrong on any of these points. On the legal strategies, I do think they're very promising, and yet they're slow, right? I mean, they're taking years and years. Many have been thrown out of the lawsuits. And they're kind of demobilizing. That is, you're kind of left uh, as, you know, the sort of the social movement uh, that is needed to, address, to get this country moving on climate change, uh, if they're waiting around for the, you know, the lawsuit to make, to grind its way through the circuit courts and the next circuit and then the Supreme and the appeals and the Supreme appeals courts and the appeals, anyway, you get the idea. Um, I'm worried about that. That is, this happens often in environmental justice communities that they turn to a legal strategy there's a lot of reasons why social movements turn to legal strategies in America, um, and yet many of those are demobilizing and they end up actually sometimes even dividing the communities that put forward the, the lawsuits. So I, I have great hope for them, but I'm, I'm worried about those two factors. Um, on the valley of death for academics, um, there are almost no incentives for academics in America to um, to cross that valley. I mean, there's some, you know, we get sort of personal satisfaction out of our number of Twitter followers or our, you know, getting in the, getting quoted in the New York Times or something. That's great. Um, but 
sometimes our colleagues are even wondering if we're doing our job if we get that. Like, what are you doing wasting your time on Twitter? Why are you, you know, talking to reporters? I mean, I'm exaggerating slightly, but especially for junior faculty, it's a, it's a risk. Um, so, and to be a junior faculty, I mean, everybody maybe knows this, takes seven or eight years. You've got to walk through that valley of death to get to the other side where when it's like more okay for you to be political, you know, in the sense of actually, you know, building a public profile. So anyway, the incentives are terrible. And, and what this means is really reorganizing academia and changing the rules of, you know, how we get reviewed for our salary reviews, for our um, tenure cases, for even hiring and firing, and that is valuing public engagement and what we call in sociology, public sociology or public social science. Um, so it means a lot of change for our institutions. Um, and I hope that they're coming. Um, I see a little bit of progress. You know, I've been in academia almost 30 years now, and I, you know, I think there's a little bit of change, but not, a, not as much as uh, one would hope. And then finally on transparency. Sorry, I am being a total wet blanket, aren't I? So Got you on all Fortunately, so it's early enough that, that people can beat me up. So um, on transparency. So I've been studying transparency for about over 10 years in the UN negotiations. And the argument that we make is that if there was better data on who's giving how much funding to developing countries to help them deal with climate change, then there would be better, we would be able to learn what's working, we would, that people giving the funding would actually <coughs> feel competent that what they were giving the money for would, uh, that it was being used for what they said it was going to be used for, and therefore the funding would continue to flow. Anyway, a series of arguments like this, that it would be more justly managed, that it would be, there would be more democracy, uh, that transparency would really help subordinate, that is, the groups that have less power to have more power in the system, right? That lack of transparency, hiding, as you said, helps the powerful. Which I, you know, I've spent 10 years on this, and I believe that on, you know, sort of an emotional level. But I'm worried about it. That is, it takes a lot of capacity to be able to use information. And so what I'm worried is that we have to have better transparency on financial flows, it will help the research, but there's going to have to be capacity set up to analyze that information, to make it digestible, to get it across the valley of death, to make it usable by those very social movements who can, you know, mobilize around it and say, look, we are being lied to, look where this money's flowing. So, and, and there needs to be f resources, not just on sort of the academic side, but also on the understanding what the information means on the side of communities and social movements and so on. So. In other words, it's not so simple. It's not that bad. Uh, uh, now, uh, supposedly, I get to respond. For your is, team. Which is always good, because I can, I can, we, Timmons and I argue all the time. Um, is this on? Is it yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You just have to point it at your right. mouth. <laughs> point it at your mouth. Now I turned it off. So. I have to be smarter than the equipment. Um, so you actually do have to point it at your mouth. Oh, like this? <laughs> okay. Yeah. A slow but trade. That's not a slogan. Uh, okay. Um, so, so, all right. So, for, Timmons makes four arguments. Counter-publicity, social movements versus court cases, value of death, and transparency. Right? Okay. So, counter-publicity. You're right. The, the ratio will be 20 to 1 for every commercial that Al Gore put out. ExxonMobil, API, et cetera, we'll put out 20. Lobbying, we'll have one lobbyist show up, they'll have 10. Okay. This resource imbalance isn't going away. Okay. Now, my point is, is right now on the advertising, it's about 20 to zero. Yep. Is that the climate movement has a serious amount of money. There is a lot of money in the Energy Foundation, the, the ULIT, all these different things, but they don't. One, they don't even think about the, the advertising efforts at all. I've reviewed their internal planning documents. They're all about how do we get more renewable energy? How do we better do scientific communication? And nothing, not, not even a recognition of the fact that there's opposition to their activities. So the climate movement itself is just sort of just like, we don't want to go here. We don't want to look at this. We don't want to, want to think about it, much less divert some of the internal resources we have to debunking it. 
Now, I would argue that everybody in this room that saw those ads and saw my presentation will never look at those ads the same way again. And that was just one time, and ExxonMobil can run their ad, and API can run their ad 500 times, and every time you're going to go, here they go lying again. There's no way that they can kind of pull it back. And that's the power of the inoculation strategy, is that once you demonstrate to people that they recognize that, it is a vaccine. And so all you need is one vaccine. You don't need to vaccine, vaccinate every time. You don't need 100 vaccinations for 100 commercials. You need one, and that's probably good for 1,000 or 2,000 commercials. So my point on counter-publicity is that a little, a little bit of publicity in the inoculation campaign can go a hell of a long way. Okay. Point two, movement versus court cases. I would argue that getting rid of the obstruction of the climate uh, disinformation campaign and obstruction campaign is a necessary but not sufficient step to create a sustainable society. Is that getting rid of the ob obstacles doesn't solve anything. We've just gotten rid of the people that are standing in the way, and that means that the Green New Deal and all of the effort that goes into that, building community support for sustainability, is something quite different from the court cases. But what the value of the court cases are, for me, in the long run, is that it shows, it removes the social license that these that these corporations are actually acting in good faith and, and can be trusted in the long run for the best interests of the country and not for their, their own, you know, best interests of the corporation. And so by showing the court cases and showing the documentation that they lie to you, one, it educates people about that, and it starts to move them out of the way so that the social movements can concentrate and focus on alternatives to building alternative uh, practices and sort of get, it, it, it enables them to actually do something on, a, on an open field where instead of trying to just, just to try to get their voice out. The valley of death, I'm, I'm afraid that that's just almost a, a, a total problem because the amount of time that you have to take to, to, inter, to, to first educate a reporter about what your, you know, what your thing is doing I will spend four hours with some press people to get one line in a press story. And the reward for that is, in the academic world, zero. Or, or negative. almost negative. Yeah. And, and that's something that the deans and provosts have to address, is that if they want to have these kind of impacts, they have to reward that kind of behavior. Because, I mean, I can do it because I'm, you know, a senior full professor, I don't care. You know, I can do whatever I want. But for junior and, 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 and uh, for associate and assistant professors, that's, that's time taken away from research things that they will get rewarded for or they have to do. And, and that's something you know, that, that the academic world needs to actually sort of really think about. The other thing... Bob, and, and Bob, 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 let's bring all those up. All right, so my last point, on the, research, on the research capacity and transparency, it would be nice if we had some funding. Because right now, all this is kind of voluntary effort by part-time people who just want to do it. And that that's not a way to build an academic field. And let's open it. Shall we open up? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Open away. Oh, good. And here I, I did in not succeed at bringing four. the economist back in. <laughs> um, I want to ask a question and add on to the discussion of the, the value of death which is, I think, another dimension that's challenging for us is that we're trained to be so cautious and yeah. present many caveats and be the biggest skeptics of our own work. And then in talking to journalists or policymakers, it becomes really scary if we feel that we have to make a definitive statement or a numerical prediction that we normalize, you know, normally wouldn't be comfortable making so definitively. Can we be useful while maintaining our precision and, and, and caveats? Do we have to find a different way of talking about research in order to cross the valley and be useful? What's your advice? There's a lot of trainings that have been going on now to help natural scientists talk about climate change, because indeed they're saying, well, there's a 98% chance of X, and we, you know, our best evidence you know, suggests that this is true. So I think there's not been that kind of training for social scientists to talk about what we're 
researching on climate change. So I think there's that. And so there's giving the confidence to learning how to say uh, what we found in with less caveats and say, you know, this is the general trend that I found. I'm not an expert on that communication. I think it's that, yes, there is a lot that can be done. Also, it doesn't have to be you. If your house catches fire, you don't have to put the fire out. You call the fire department. If somebody breaks into your car, you don't have to figure out who did it. You call the police department. If the Russians come ashore in Maine, the Marines go and deal with it. You've got people who have that job and are trained for it. In academia, there's nobody that I can find who has the job and is trained for getting stuff across the valley of death. And I think, frankly, if our response to this is, well, that's yeah. going to be up to every individu individual scientist right. to master this on their own, Absolutely. forget about it. Absolutely. Universities, scientific organizations have to take this on as a problem and say, where we are being persistently lied about, we have to create the Marines or the fire department or whomever to translate. And that way, the scientists can keep knocking away at their research and doing what they do best and don't have to get an amateur sub-degree in public relations, which a lot of people aren't suited for. It's just not why they went into science. Yeah. But somebody's doing it, even if it's simple as getting Bob's work into the Brown Alumni Magazine, that's going to get out to tens, tens of, of thousands thousand. of influential people. And if the alumni magazines all did that, that would be a pretty big deal. And if the American Society for the whatever you're a member of, you know, they have publications that now focus internally, but could just as easily be adapted to have a component that is the broadcast component of right. what's cool, what's good, why this matters, how we're being lied about, and by whom. And the conservative movement has think tanks playing that role. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, translating academic research, That's actually right. developing it. Best. And, and lying about yours. Out there. And one, uh, add one thing on that. I think there is a, um, a, an audience question because, you know, it, at Greenpeace, you couldn't get away with designing a campaign on unsustainable seafood, for example, but, and say my audience is the public. In that case, more likely because you're talking about consumers, but actually the audience would be investors in supermarkets or, you know, the board of something a more strategic audience, but I think there's a, you know, there are professionals who do communications, and um, if your audience is young people, you team up with RISD and do a comic book version of uh, your story. If your audience is, uh, well, see, your eyes lit up, that's good. Um, <laughs> Matthew, <laughs> Matthew's work. Matthew's property you down. You know, lost, I, yeah. when, I, when I saw Matthew, you, your, your presentation was cut short on the survivor, surviving cities. Holy crap. I mean, that's a headline in every city. If I was a public interest, you know, group and I had that kind of data and I could say, turns out Tampa might not, you know, has an X percent chance of not being here in X years. That's a, a real finding and pretty stark because people think everything's permanent and it ain't. Um, so that could be easily turned into a, you know, a public interest piece of work with a lot of you know, legwork talking to editors and journalists in those towns, but but it's pretty hot work. I mean, in terms of publicly available information, your city might not be here in, you know, this many generations is a real finding. Um, some of it's a little harder, so like your work is, is a little bit denser and harder to turn into a comic book or a, a headline, but there's an audience that wants to hear that it's, you know, the system's broken and the the adaptation funding is not working. And that's, you know, maybe more specifically through a hearing to, you know, a, a, a specific business audience. Or, or the American Association of City Planners. Or correct. Of, so right. they're the national, can, the mayor, you know, you present at a, at a, at a, a target. So I think that's the, the valley of death answer, but. We got Barnaby in the way back. Um, yeah, no, hold on. Do you need oh, the sorry. microphone and we've got someone else here first. In a moment, Barnaby, thanks. Uh, you know, thank you, Kurt, for, uh, pointing out that this kind of communication can be managed and can be done. Early in the morning we heard about it was important to have a multidisciplinary team that it isn't something that one individual acting on her own or, or his own can, can really manage. And it sounded a little bit like we were leaving out uh, intentionally mm -hmm. the interaction between the press uh, and the scientists, the academicians. 
yet the press really is the tool. Now, there's the print press that is in the process of losing its circulation, progressively dying, uh, and then as you bring up the uh, more youthful mechanisms of this. And, and so I, I think we should really maintain uh, a working and progressively uh, more powerful relationship with the press of today because they're the ones that the younger voters will be paying attention to. Thanks for considering uh, the reporters as potential friends and not just obstacles to academic careers. And social media, I mean, it's just, it's a whole new game, right? So if you had someone who was working with your lab, uh, Timmons, who was good at graphics or at videos or at, um, you know, short graphic presentations of the findings and you get them out, on Facebook, on Twitter, as graphics, that's what people digest. Yeah. Small, you know, they're not reading papers. They're read, not reading anything, actually. Um, short lines of, of substance with graphics. So that's a, you know, and it's ex so experimental, it's so easy to see what works because you see what people click on. And then you do more of that. You don't waste money uh, running, you know, uh, multi million dollar ads during the Super Bowl. You run hundreds of dollars worth of ads on Facebook or on, on uh, you know, promoting something on Twitter, and you get a response like that. It's an instant mechanism of feedback. And to date, climate change doesn't get it's very many clicks. Well, you know, so I, I would quibble with that. I think I, I've seen I polling agree. that it, it, it's more than coming. It's a prominent issue now, uh, and it is, uh, it's growing. I think you can blame the political establishment for a lot of that. Republicans don't want to talk about it because they know they're trapped between reality and the ideology brothers. and donors and the Koch brothers. <laughs> yeah. So they have a real problem. And we as Democrats have um, a particular, I think, disability of um, being in a kind of a, a poll chasing cycle. Yeah. I think every candidate is told by their stupid consultants, here are the top three issues the polling says that people care about, so you talk about those three. And then you're told by your focus group, what the way is that the public most likes to hear you talk about them, and you come out the end of that sounding like an automaton or a robot or a machine of some kind, you've lost your authenticity, and you've lost your ability as a party to show real leadership. Yeah. I mean, for Pete's sake, look what the Republicans did about the estate tax. One person in like 50 million was ever going to pay the estate tax. It's at the bottom of everybody's priority list. But their political leadership talked about it and drove it up to the point where some guy making 30000 bucks a year goes, yeah, we had a big win on the estate tax that I'm never going to pay. <laughs> I mean, if they can do that with the estate tax, think what exactly we could right. do with climate change that 73% of the population cares about. Right. If we got out of the poll chasing cycle and actually were strategic and went for wins. And there's been a breakthrough, uh, I even in the last Sorry, year, um, all of these it, catastrophic <laughs> events from the fires in California to the multiple storms, um, the polar vortex, people are waking up. Wait, you know, the, the planet is waking us up. And then you have the Weather Channel putting out a video beaten on Trump. So that's a shift. Yeah. That didn't used to happen. <laughs> um, and where, what's, where does everybody go when they're, when they're about to be hit by a hurricane? The Weather Channel. And, this, and there, are scientists, there are meteorologists on there saying, end climate. And it's become it, it required, almost. So that's a real shift. Having worked on this you know, in the late 90s, when we would literally buy a case of beer and throw a party when there was one article we got one article in the paper about climate science. We would throw a party. It was that infrequent, even after Kyoto. It really was not news. Bush made more news rejecting the Kyoto Protocol in 2001 than the Kyoto Protocol itself made in 1997. More that was true media with Paris, actually, yeah. true. And Paris, right? And it's, withdrawal. it's almost like, and people were like, what, we had a treaty? And now it's been killed by Trump. Now I know about it, right? They didn't know about it to begin with. And the same with these, so I think there's a, we're at a moment, and you know, Sunrise is stepping into this into this moment with with gusto, um, pushing us. And it's not, you know, it it's never been here before. Like we were in we're in brand new space, and I think there's a there's opportunity in that. 
Um, follow, following on that, I think it's really constructive. Uh, this last afternoon has really looked at the area we particularly need to look at, the sociology, the psychology, the group psychology, and the rhetorical advantage. It wasn't the estate tax they got rid of. It was the death tax, which was a rhetorical little flourish which caused it to be effective. So it's about communication strategy as well. And on the valley of death, I just wanted to announce that um, um, most of the presidents, and I think all of them, of all the institutions of higher education in Rhode Island have agreed to form a uh, convocation where their expertise and their departments and their students can cooperatively work to bring this message to the citizenry and the, the voting public in a constructive way. And finally, I want to re-emphasize what Senator Whitehouse said during lunch. One of our big challenges is this circular firing thought, squad mentality, where in trying to fine-tune particular things, sometimes it's the attacks we incur within the environmental community that then got leveraged and advantaged for part of a opposition message. So we've, uh, and I know there's a lot to be debated and there are a lot of issues there, but I do have a, a positive sense of it and we do need to bring everyone from the arts to the universities to communication and to translation from the academic articles and the science to public understanding. Uh, how about Joe? Yes. Mark, wait, Joe's, Joe's been waiting up here. Uh, okay. well, so, so a, a quick comment about how we as academics can try to cross this valley of death. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm in the system, I understand there's virtually no reward and there's a good bit of cost because we really don't know how to write 800 words for an op-ed effectively or we don't really know how to talk to reporters effectively. And I think that we have seen in recent years a couple of vehicles become available for academics. I, I write for the conversation which is a nonprofit. They get a lot of money from the Sloan Foundation, and their job is to have you know, about a half dozen academics a day on a whole array of topics, but they have an environment and energy editor, so they try to have three to four of these a week, where it is written by an academic, but it is in a style of an op-ed, and importantly, that editor does a heavy edit, because we're lousy op-ed writers, and makes it dramatically better, and, and it has two really nice things. One is because it's online, Three nice things. One, because it's online, you can hyperlink to your original study, so you're actually getting some people who read this who may see your original work. Two, their business model is anybody can reprint this. So I've had things reprinted in, you know, everything from the Chicago Tribune online and the San Francisco Chronicle to like a random paper in West Texas I never heard of, but as it turns out, they have an ethanol plant and they really didn't like Administrator Pruitt and I was criticizing what he was trying to do on the health benefits of reducing air pollution, and if it meant I was criticizing Administrator Pruitt, they liked it. They republished that 15 minutes after it went online. <laughs> uh, so, so the thing is, is you start getting away, they, these things get republished in a lot of different kinds of places yeah. where people you wouldn't normally be able to reach can actually see it. And the third is I've actually had a number of press calls by people who are reporters in this space. This is how they're trying to get smart on stuff, and they use this as a way to reach out to you. So it has actually helped build out a network of reporters who are like, oh wait, you wrote something in English on something I've been trying to understand. Can we talk about it a little bit more? So I, I think, you know, again, this doesn't help a deal with the rewards in which they're internal. It's this, I, I do research, I want to have an impact in the world with the research and this is a vehicle for doing that. But it, it does lower the cost and I think increases our effectiveness when we're trying to communicate that. So it's worth, you know, for those academics that are sort of looking out for these kinds of vehicles, uh, to get your work out there. It's like right. functioning basically like a think tank, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's absolutely critical to get John Q. Public on board. You know, the, the average factory worker does not read the Wall Street Journal or academic uh, articles. And the best way to do that is through the wallet. And I encourage the climate economists here to put a dollar value on what it will cost communities in Rhode Island and Connecticut to rebuild their storm sewer systems that are right now overwhelmed by the increased intensity storms we're getting. The fishermen in Point Judith have to deal with migration of the fish stocks. In, in, in Connecticut, the lobsters have moved. If you're a soybean farmer, out in out west somewhere, you may not be able to plant soybeans much longer. And I think we have to put a dollar value on these things. What will it cost Miami to move? And once the public 
understands the actual dollar value and how that imp impacts them personally, I think they will be a lot more supportive and you will get their vote. I'm going to put in two cents now while I'm here. Uh, great conversation. No, it's been really good. Um, so there's, there's one other aspect I would highlight in this. There's a, a wonderful book. I think it was the PhD dissertation of the economist John Kenneth Galbraith, and it's about the Great Crash of 1926. And apart from the fact that Chapter 4 is called In Goldman Sachs We Trust, seriously, nothing ever changes. In Chapter 5, there's this wonderful bit about being at a dinner party and knowing when a bubble's there. And the answer is, because people who know nothing about the subject are talking authoritatively with other people who nothing, know nothing about the subject about this thing that they know nothing about. And that's sort of the great marker of a bubble. Welcome to Congress. It sounds like it. But, but, it, also sounds like, but it also sounds like the weak point in that is precisely where we are, which is, come on, the arguments of the other side are just rubbish. I mean, they're simple rubbish. They don't stand up. There's no, let's not debate that you're just making stuff up. This is just nonsense. And that moment of revelation can be incredibly powerful. And all you really need to do is just call them on it. So just as a personal anecdote on this, a few years ago, there's a thing called the International Swaps and Derivatives Association. And that's basically Derivatives Traders Trade Association. And I was doing something with one of their members and wrote this conference. And I made some suggestion about derivatives might actually have been a bit of a problem in the financial crisis. And this guy turned around to me and shot at me like, well, you don't want to hurt liquidity, do you? And it was like, let's drop this word liquidity. You know, we all know what it means. No, we don't know what it means, right? But when you say that, that just shuts you off. It's an authority play. So I said, well, actually we do, because all that liquidity is, it means that you get to do more of these trades, which are dangerous. And once I called him on it, he had nowhere else to go. Right? Now, and I think that's exactly where this conversation is. They're at the point, it's the trenches, right? But behind the trenches, there's a firing squad wall. Yeah. That's what's happening. They've been flanked. In the back. Anyone else over here? There's some behavioral things that distinguish you as well. If you're a scientist and you are attacked and the person who attacks you is correct, you correct what you said. If you are them and you are attacked, you don't correct what you said, you say more of it because this is a hydraulic exercise in information saturation. And you can even kind of step back a little bit from what rubbish the message itself is to what rubbish their saturation techniques are. I mean, there's multiple layers upon which the rubbishing of the other side can work if we do a deliberate job of it. So I want to follow up with that because I think that uh, in the session is called Pushing Against Climate Denial and Defending Science. I think I'm going to talk about data because I think we really need to defend data. Data is under threat. I, my data, the kind of data I work with is, Mike to the oh, sorry, sorry. It's uh, the kind of data I work with is produced by the federal government and the Census Bureau. And um, there are very active conversations there right now about restricting access to population data. They can't limit it, but they make, well, they will make people like me have to travel to Boston or to you know, one of 30 census research data centers in the country in order to access data that we've had free access to for a very long time. Um, climate scientists are also facing this sort of challenge to their data, access to data at NOAA, and, um, and there are other federal agencies that, like the EPA that collect data. All of these are, um, institutions are under attack by the Trump administration. They want less data collected so that they can make up more facts <laughs> and keep us from presenting evidence. So I think that's something that needs to be addressed as well in this, any you know, follow-up papers about how do we defend science. We need to defend data. It sounds a little boring, but you know, data is, is really our lifeblood. It's also for us, in politics, quite an easy pushback on these agencies. It's very hard for them to defend that. 
When the EPA pulled this embarrassing stunt of telling the regional scientists that they couldn't present at the Narragansett Bay conference, that blew up in their face in a terrible, terrible way. And they were backpedaling and hemming and hawing like you would not believe. So when those kind of things happen, don't hesitate to come and ask people like me to send a letter to get that sorted out. Because of all the things that we can and can't do with this administration, that's one of the easier things to get done. It is very hard for them. It's easier for them to say, oh, God damn it, we got caught. We'll go ahead and go back to what was done before, rather than have to defend that and get a whole new blast of, of bad publicity. So you're on high ground in terms of challenging that, and we don't even have to know it's you so you don't get the kickback. You know, just, you know, as long as we know there's a problem, we can solve it. So don't hesitate to go to your local congressman or senator. I wanted to, I'm still trying to, oh, wait, we have a hand. Okay, good. There's a new person. Two mics are going to arrive at the same time. Stereo. So I feel like I have to frame this. Um, Timmons, I definitely came in at the basement level. And I'm hitting that 13th floor right. on the elevator, trying to get up to speed yeah. as quickly as possible. I feel what I've heard here today, um, I like the analogy of the chasm, that we've got facts and university research over here, this big chasm in citizens. And in the middle is this erosion of trust. And it is a full-time job as a, as a citizen to try to figure out what is factual. I liked... Um, I have a new understanding of dark money and how it's really driving policy. And if the dark money stays and, you know, we don't have these, these tax incentives and nothing else changes, who will be the true agents of change if we have another six years of a, of a Republican Party? Is it the Patagonians? Like, who should we be giving this data to? What corporations that are just going to do good? in the interest of doing good. Question. That was scary. <laughs> that was well, I mean, it's, it's, it's really, really scarce. It's really, really scarce. Um, Patagonia has really stood out as people who are willing to kind of lean in a little bit on environmental issues and do so uh, politically. I don't know if they're publicly traded or if they're privately owned. I don't know what their shareholder vu vulnerabilities are. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll elucidate what you're saying with a personal story. Uh, we got summoned over to um, a group called TechNet, which is the trade group for Silicon Valley, the trade association. So it's Apple, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Salesforce, and a whole bunch of green energy companies as well. And they're all so rich and powerful that instead of coming to our offices, they say, we will be in this room uh, on this date, uh, do come and let us tell you what we want you to do. So I showed up, and they have this handout, which is beautiful. I mean, it's like as glossy as those ads that you saw. And despite the fact that Salesforce and Sunrun and uh, other green energy entities are in their brochure, there's no mention of clean energy. There's no mention of green energy. There's no mention of climate change. These are the biggest and most powerful companies in America. So I yelled at them about it. I was an unpleasant visitor. And they were fussed and fussed and fussed, and they did it a second year. And I yelled at them again and started writing letters into all their companies and raising hell about this. And the third time, they came back, and now they had a mention of climate change and, but it still wasn't in their priorities. You know, they've got bullets, legislative priorities. You know, get more foreign engineers and stay out of my iPhone with your technologies and whatever. Um, don't worry about what we're doing with privacy. We're all going to be fine. <laughs> all that kind of stuff. So when you have companies that are so green, actual green energy companies, so big, so powerful, and they come to lobby us, and they don't even mention this issue, there's a big valley of death between what they're saying to the public and what they're doing and how they behave in Congress as well. So that's a thing, something we just really have to keep working on. Patagonia can't be the only company. Nobody will listen to them. And when the biggest and most powerful companies in the country organize together into the full Silicon Valley 
power clout are too chicken to mention this because they think that some Republican speaker is going to counter slap them with something they don't like because they dared to speak the unspeakable, something's got to change. And part of it is corporate America having to kind of grow a conscience in Congress, not just when they're public facing their right. consumers. I think this is vital. And, you know, back to the National Association of Manufacturers. So this is, you know, everything manufactured from cars to, you know, you name it. And while Coke and, uh, and Exxon are in there, Coke in there because they make Coke, K O C H. Yeah, sorry. And, right, Coke Industries who owns Georgia Pacific that makes brawny towels and Dixie paper cups, as well as a whole lot of plywood and two by fours. Um, and they own Invista, which makes spandex and Lycra. Um, so they make a lot of stuff that you didn't even know they made. Um, also in, in, so this is a group that is now running the counterattack on all these lawsuits through a thing called the Manufacturer's Accountability Project that says these lawsuits and other lawsuits against products are, are frivolous. Also in, so it's a, it's totally an anti-climate progress campaign run within NAM. By the way, NAM is where the Global Climate Coalition was born in 1989 after the famous summer of 88 and Jim Hansen's testimony. The first counter campaign was run out of NAM and it was not Exxon, but it was heavy industry and uh, electric utilities, coal vested interests that ran the first counter attack. So also in NAM are Pella Windows and uh, 3M and you know Honeywell that makes programmable thermostats. Those companies would get rich with climate policy that made sense. We'd all want better windows, better thermostats, better insulation. And they're sitting there like the three monkeys, you know, with Exxon running NAM, basically. So that needs to be shown and told, and they need to be shamed and and it, you know some some consumers need to explain to them um, you can't hang out with these fossil thugs and uh, think you're clean. So that's a, it's a really that's a really key point. I think the the corporate and then furthering that I think back to the lawsuits. Right now the lawsuits are mostly about uh, naming fossil fuel companies, mining and and drilling companies. But there are a whole lot of other corporate entities that have been involved for many years in the denial machinery. And then some of them snuck out of the door, uh, like Ford Motor Company in the late 90s, left the Global Climate Coalition. Bill Ford Jr. said, I, you know, I'm going to see the end of the internal combustion engine in my lifetime, and this is no longer a place we can hang out because they're saying it, it's not a problem, and I know it's a problem. But they, didn't get, they weren't held accountable. If they're drawn into this question about liability, they're going to throw the other guys under the bus they're going to talk, talk about who was the ringleader on right. denial. And we already have a pretty good idea, but when we start pushing them together, they will repel like opposite magnets. <laughs> so just uh, this really gets back to the question that we started the day with a long time ago. I'm so impressed, like 50 of you are still here. This is like a record. So why is yeah, it all work for Exxon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know that you know, the half the viewing audience is is uh, paid for from those dark money channels. So we'd like to say hi to those people, you know, like Arlo's Guthrie, you know, and some. Um, so why isn't there a science-based policy on climate change in the U.S.? So it's not just the denial side, but the failure of the other sides to show up, this problem of the, the valley of death of, uh, you know, the information about the risks not reaching the people making economic decisions um, and a whole list of other things, lack of transparency, um, and so on. So anything else, Mark, you want to add? No, no, I think there's, there's one last comment that we can keep from it short. The, from the former One very quick comment. You, you all need to know how unbelievably lucky we are to have a senator sit with us all day. Absolutely. And give those kinds of insights. <laughs> chance to meet the New England crew, <laughs> and not all of them would sit here that long, although our, our senator from Connecticut would. Uh, but anyway, thank you very much, sir. And, and secondly, um, this valley of death, I just want to remind everybody, a lot was accomplished in the environmental movement in the 90s, and we had scientists part of our team at Save the Bay, and I can tell you back in 1985, 
people did not under understand estuary science across this across this community. So there are opportunities. Um, what is frustrating is there's more there. I'd love to mine the universities when I was in that job more than I did. Um, but I think there are opportunities, and uh, I invite science people, as, as just as uh, the Senator said, we were plumbers. We were translators at, at Save the Bay. We we're, the, were the people who could explain all this stuff to people. And we had key scientists who were part of it, and, and we would never have achieved what was achieved but for that. So I encourage any scientist to get involved with, with a group, help them understand the issues, and they are pretty good at, at talking about these issues. Yeah. And I agree completely. We're in a moment of disruption, grabbing this morning's panel and kind of bringing it forward. We're in a moment of disruption. This is going to come unraveled here and, and making those key connections. Oh my gosh, it's going to be very exciting. I'm with the Senator. Very excited for all of this. It could be great. That was a nice, nice wrap there. Good wrap up. Optimism. So there's. <laughs>